Hey, Mickey, how are you doing today? Quite fine, thank you so much. What about you? I'm, t I'm doing great. It's, uh, it's getting cold outside and winter's coming, but um, I don't let that bother me. Yeah, but at least you don't have uh, uh, one hell of a fog that we have here in Italy in, in my hometown. <laughs> oh, you have a f uh, it's fog in there, huh? Yeah, it looks like the John Carpenter's movie. <laughs> <laughs> I love that movie. But I, I hope I hope the same thing doesn't happen to you that happens in the movie though. No. <laughs> For, no, I don't live close to the sea, so <laughs> oh, that's good. Okay, that's good. That's good. Uh, but are you that's living good. in in Phoenix? Sir? No, no, I'm um, I'm in uh, I'm out right side of outside the New York area in Connecticut. I will be going away to, to the Phoenix area um in January and For a couple of months, but um, <clears throat> right now I'm here through through the Christmas holidays. So, ah, okay. I have a band uh, uh, named the Mugshots, and our latest album has been produced by Dick Wagner before he died. Oh yes, okay, I know Dick. Yeah, yeah, and, and so I was in uh, Camelback where you did the high school. Wow, that's right. That's where I went to high school. We just had, <laughs> if you can believe it, <laughs> just had my fiftieth um, class reunion last April in Phoenix, and I went out there for that. And and uh, people in the the band that I was in high school at uh, Camelback, the Laser Beats. It was a rock band in high school that I was part of, and two of the members were there with me. So um, you know, it was. I haven't seen them or talked to them in 50 years, but I ran into them there. So there are still a couple of people from Camelback around it from our class, and that's that's great that you were there. It's been awesome to to stay in Camelback, <laughs> and mm -hmm. and yep. I'm sending you my uh, yeah, the greetings from Alice because I met him three days ago here in Milano. Oh, he was there, huh? Yeah, he played with uh, Motley Crue. Yeah, right on the tour. Yeah, well, we've seen him in. Uh, two shows in uh, in the states we we just saw him in Dallas and, and in Connecticut right almost next door to where I live he played there and so we've we've been together several times this uh, you know this year yeah and he told me about uh, the reunion in Dallas I guess uh? yes uh, how was that gig well it was great we had that was a lot of fun you know it was I think everybody <clears throat> everybody was you know there was no pressure we're just together playing like we always have played and And just have a great time and play some great songs. And um, it was a smaller crowd, so uh, you know it was uh, people were weren't even expecting it. It was a surprise, and uh, we were we had talked to Alice and hope hopefully he would he was able to get there and he did. And and it was it was great. You know we always have a great time when we're together. I mean it was it's a uh, you know it's like a family and and um, you know we had a lot of success back in the day. And so when we get together and the The people still appreciate it. It's great. Yeah, and what do you recall about the uh, ceremony of the induction of the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame in 2011? Uh, well, I think, uh, you know, the, the celebrities that were there that, <clears throat> that we talked to, um, Michael J. Fox was there. He's a huge Alice Cooper fan. And um, uh, there was uh, a couple of other people, and uh, Michael Douglas, he was there, <laughs> and uh, the actor, uh, and in meeting Bette Midler, Elton John, we've known forever. So it was like, you know, we met a lot of new friends and a lot of friends that we've, you know, that we haven't seen, that I haven't seen in years. But um, of course, it was a it was a big honor. But I was I was very happy for the fans that have been sticking by us over the years and. You know, hopefully one day seeing us get in the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, and we did. And I, I certainly acknowledge that in my in my speech. And it was great to play and 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 be part of a, the, a great you know a great event for sure. What do you recall about like the most uh, uh, savage memories of the early days? <laughs> there's a lot of there's a lot of those, Mickey. Um, <laughs> boy, but uh, I tell you, there's a, an awful lot of them. I think I think just the fact that. That we 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 tried, you know, we were on the we were like road warriors on the road. We we tried so long with pretty few and easy action before we actually had a hit song, and uh, <clears throat> you know it was just it just surviving. I mean, you know, we were by the time I'm I'm 18 and Love It to Death hit the charts, we were very you know, we were in debt, a lot of money for in those days. So we needed we needed to be to bail ourselves out, and that was part of our motivation. But But it was all scary. It was all crazy. I mean, we were, we we were uh, going against the grain, and we always were trying things new and different. Everybody told us that we would never be successful at what we were doing, and 
you know, short time later and years later, we proved everybody wrong. So it was, it was an uphill battle from the word go, but we were all five of us but were very tight together and had one goal in mind, and, and that was to create something new and to try to sell a lot of records and, and have a lot of people appreciate our music. But um, it was always a struggle. And then, uh, then once it finally broke open after Love It to Death, and it was just a matter of, you know, writing some great albums and some great songs and putting some great shows together. Yeah, and what memories do you have about working with uh, uh, Frank Zappa's and the Straight Records? Well, Frank, <clears throat> Frank was it was a ver that was very much a business proposition for us. Um, I mean, as a musician, we respect him. We respected him immensely, but um, he he put us on uh, when Pretty's for You was ready to come out. Uh, he put us on a tour up the west coast of the United States, uh, from California to to Canada, and. So he gave us a big break. He gave us our first record deal. Um, but other than that, we, you know, we really didn't hang out and party. Uh, in the process of doing that, he, he had a lot of different ideas because we were very creative. We knew exactly what we wanted to do as Alice Cooper. He had totally different ideas. And so that was where we had to find management that, that, that would represent us. And uh, with Alive Enterprises and Shep Gordon and Joe Greenberg, We we found that and and you know then they would they would go in there and fight for what we wanted to do, so it was there was a lot of tension uh, business tension between um, Alice Cooper and Frank Zappa and Straight Records, but uh, it was uh, we're very thankful that we had the opportunity to have somebody at least acknowledge the band and give us a record deal and then it was a launching a launching uh, point for us to to go to Warner Brothers after that. Yeah, and uh, uh, later on, working with uh, Bob Ezrin as a, a producer changed uh, everything, I guess. Well, uh, Bob was Bob was the element. I mean, we had, you know, we had a record label now, Warner Brothers, and we had uh, Live Enterprises managing us, and, and we had the five of us. So, the the last key to everything being successful was finding the right producer that was our band's producer, and Pretty's for You didn't didn't really work with a producer and easy action didn't really gel so um when when everything worked and we we found some we found a company nimbus nine out of toronto canada to uh they were producing the guess who and we wanted jack richardson was the was the producer that was doing them and they were they had a string of hits and we wanted somebody that could make hits and so jack richardson didn't want to produce us but Bob Ezrin saw us and, and, and told Jack that he wanted to work with us. So the first album, Love It to Death, Jack and Bob both worked on with us. And then after that, Bob, you know, pretty much worked on it, you know, worked together with us as like the sixth member of the band. And it made all the difference in the world what, what, he, what he could do to make hit records and to make hit arrangements it was the element that, that we needed. And so, uh, again, it was the, really the last piece of the puzzle to make to make really good albums and to take what we were doing and Bob Bob was our first big fan that really understood it and he was the perfect person too because he had never recorded an album before we'd actually recorded two albums before so it was his first project that he worked on and it was our third so um you know the third one was a charm for us and the first one was was a you know a gold album for him and a hit single so it was it was a perfect marriage And uh, talking about uh, the Who, is that true that you always uh, had one more drum than uh, Keith Moon? <laughs> <laughs> That's a good story, but it's not a true story, no. <laughs> okay. But it's a good story. I, I, I like the story. I, I mean, I don't think anybody, I think it's pretty trivial when you think about it. My whole, you know, I was just trying to make hit records and, 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 and stay alive on the road when we started touring at a, you know, at a big, at a fast pace. And I wasn't worried about any other drummers at the time at all, but uh, Keith Moon was one of my early influences for sure, and The Who still one of my favorite all-time bands. Nobody could, nobody could play a live show like The Who with uh, the original lineup of the group. And uh, when I think about uh, Keith Moon, I think about, of course, uh, excesses. Uh, did you leave any kind of excesses back then? Well, I think just the nature of the business. <clears throat> um, you know, there was a point when I had to. I mean, I, you know, drummers, uh, of course, 
a lot of musicians, especially drummers, were, were dying in the late yeah. 60s and early 70s back in the day. And there's a point when you have to say, okay, can, um, you know, I have to, I have to pace myself. I'd rather, yeah. instead of drinking a, a bottle of vodka, I'll drink uh, a couple of beers in one night because I want I want to go for the long haul and uh, cut out all hard narcotics and and because there everything was around it's uh, you know and I I I don't really have what I call an addictive personality I can basically if I want to smoke a cigarette I'll smoke a cigarette and I don't need to smoke for you know for another year uh, and the same with everything but uh, yeah we were everything was around us and if you if you just indulge too much, party too much, um, it can be dangerous, and and it you know killed a lot of people, unfortunately. But I think that the other thing is, as we got bigger and bigger, Dennis and I, I mean, I'm the drummer of the band. The, the drummer has to be a solid, pivotal point of the music and of the show, and and I couldn't go up there and get fucked up like I used to. And just go crazy. Um, I had to be solid, and so did Dennis. Uh, us together as a rhythm section. So as the band got bigger and bigger, I actually did less and less as far as uh, as far as alcohol and, and drugs. And by the time uh, Billion Dollar Babies, I think even schools out, I stopped all drugs and I haven't touched them since. And um, just to, you know, occasionally have uh, a couple of cold beers. On a hot day, and uh, that uh, you know that was I think what what helped me what helped me survive, and uh, I think everybody in the in the group was was pretty you know pretty savvy about that and, and, and taking care of themselves. Um, unfortunately, after the band broke up, um, Alice had some some bad health bad times health wise in the early '80s, but luckily he found a way to get through it and has been healthy ever since and never touched any drugs or alcohol and. And uh, he's he's to be commended for that, but yeah, it was around all of us, and we just had to decide, you know, if we wanted to let it control our lives or if we would control our own lives. And I decided that I'd control my own life. Yeah, and your drum style is really one of a kind. If I think about, I don't know, Halo Flies, Little Billion Dollar Babies, Black Juju, which are your main inspirations as a drummer? Yep. I, well, I I always what I would I, what was great about the band. I mean, you know, we knew each other since college and you know, were friends before um, anything else. And and one of the the reasons when Dennis and Mike and Glenn and I started playing together, you know, we would experiment and and nobody would would put limitations on anybody else. I'm a rudimentary rudimentary drummer. I've been playing since I was nine years old, and I and I uh, I played in marching bands. I played in orchestras. So I understand all the different percussions. I'm just, you know, just not like a glorified metronome, just keeping a beat. And so I, I, when when I write songs, Mickey, I like to write them, uh, the drum parts. The only the only audience I care about are, are other drummers. Yeah. If other drummers like what I do and appreciate what I do, I've been very successful. Obviously, a lot of other people have enjoyed what I do. It's like even the like the Tom Tom part in Schools Out. The, it's like a bolero almost. It's you know it's a, a marching bolero and and um, if if it's something that it, it's different too. I mean everything that we always did was different and and I love drums and I love to ha hear them you know produced in in records and uh, so it gave me really the the band gave me the freedom to do whatever I want. Of course, Billion Dollar Babies is another one. The the song starts with with the flam intro. And uh, and I you know play it throughout the song. So again, it's really a, a percussion-driven song, and I I think a lot of those you know Alice doesn't do that too much anymore in his songs. It's first of all you have to really understand the rudiments of drumming, and and I think that that's you know that certainly helped me. Plus, like I said, the guys in the band, everybody could experiment and do you know be creative as they wanted to. Yeah, and uh, uh, right now, uh, Killsmith and the Greenfire Empire. Is the third like chapter of the, uh, your solo career? Am I right? Right, you're absolutely yeah. Kill, the Killsmith solo CDs, yes. And it's like, uh, is it like a concept album about drugs in South America and stuff? Can you tell us something about this? Right, yeah. Well, the, yeah, the Killsmith and the Green Fire Empire. Uh, Killsmith is the name of my solo project um, since 2006. With and the Green Fire Empire, uh, I, it was a story that's sort of been around for a long time. A concept, 
and all the songs just sort of came together on this project and it's it's like a like a mini like a rock opera and and I wanted the music to be more like billion dollar babies where there's a lot of different i mean it's it's definitely heavy metal but there's also <clears throat> some uh, some texture in it so there's like some some slower songs and some some faster songs then some and uh, <laughs> a song like pandemonium uh, it's, it's, a, it's a big drum song. It's almost like, you know, just drums all the way through the song. Uh, but the story is um, uh, a young boy in the rainforest um, in, in South America, <clears throat> and he stumbles across a, uh, uh, he's, he's like a loner, and he stumbles across a secret formula in some ancient uh, pre-Columbian ruins. And he, uh, he also finds a, a treasure of emeralds, um, and he deciphers. He goes to school and he deciphers what the uh, what the tablet says, and it's actually an ancient formula for a sacrificial drug. And um, in the drug, there's also uh, it's it's a very psychedelic drug, but it also has a time uh, an element of time travel. So you can go back, you can go into the future. And uh, he he becomes very wealthy with his treasure. He discovers what this formula is, and he starts manufacturing. The drug, and he sells it, uh, and becomes the, the the most powerful drug lord in in the world, in, in the in the planet, and in a fic, in a fictitious uh, country called Blue Soul Land, um, there's a uh, uh, a person. His name is is William Smith, and he ends up being a um, uh, a very very uh, elite um, special ops uh, military man. And when he retires, uh, he gets married to his lifelong sweetheart, and um, she is killed in the drug wars that happened between the the the, 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 the rival gangs that are selling the the, the, the drug. It's called Green Fire, and uh, and when Green Fire is, <clears throat> like I said, when it's taken, uh, there's a there's an element you can travel. Through time, and if, and you can see your own death. And when if you see your own death while you're stoned on this drug, while you take the drug, then you actually die. Your heart explodes. So, um, but there's a lot of violence, and, and beautiful cities have, have now fallen to pieces because of the drug. Kills Will Smith. He he's such a professional and such a great shot uh, in the military. He gets a na- nickname Kill Smith. And uh, the the album um, talks about the story. It's, I also have a book of the story. Uh, it explains how uh, after his wife is accidentally killed, that he goes and he wants to destroy the Green Fire Empire and um, uh, the the drug lord. So that that's basically the story of the of the book. And which are now your uh, immediate and future plans? You're still working in the uh, real estate area, I guess. And then what about music? Uh, well, music. I've been. Um, it's it's like music. I've been working on a film with a friend of mine, Jason Bird, mm-hmm. and the film is called um, uh, Desolation Angels: Rise of the Boas, and they actually have a Facebook page. Oh. And we've been working on the movie for about two years, and now it's uh, we we've shot all the scenes. Uh, the morning after Halloween this year, we shot the final scene in 2015, and hopefully next year, 2016, it'll. It will be released. Um, very low budget movie, but again, it's a. Um, uh, I, I play the the part of a. Um, this has nothing to do with my solo album, The Green Fire Empire, but I play a uh, Russian mobster who's a the head of a, uh, a a Russian crime family in the in the New York tri-state area, mm-hmm. uh, out of Brighton Beach, and uh, my um, my closest allies are the Mexican cartel. And there's a, a military group from the United from the United States government called the Boas that uh, that are hired by the government to destroy my organization and the, uh, the and my Mexican cartel friends, and that's the movie. And uh, it's a it's a interesting screenplay. It's it's very uh, uh, like I said, it's very low budget, so it's not going to be like the the new James Bond or anything like that. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but uh, but it's a good story, and that's why I decided to get involved with it. So uh, that that's my entertainment project I've been working on, and I may be writing a song or two for the uh, the soundtrack for that album as well. Thank you so much. Have you got any like final message greeting to the Italian fans of Neil Smith? Well, all I know is I would love to come over there one day. We were supposed to go over there in '72 to uh, to Italy to play. 
on the schools out tour, but um, uh, at the last minute, the, the the show because of our reputation and what was going on in the government at the time, uh, the show was canceled, and I was very sad that that happened. I've always wanted to go there and play because I know we have a big following, and I've yeah. met a lot of Italian fans that have come over to the United States for different special Alice Cooper original group events, and uh, and I know they're very very uh, uh, you know big fans, and uh, you know we love them. And uh, you, your country has great wine and great food and beautiful women and beautiful people. So uh, you know my uh, my my greetings to to everyone there, and uh, and anybody that's there that ever wants to say hi to me, they can just go to my website, which is neilsmithrocks.com, dot com, spelled N E A L. Don't forget, I spell my name a little bit different than some other people. Not not But like I, Neil Young. <laughs> no, especially not like Neil Young. And uh, I would, I always answer all of my um, my uh, messages, and, and would would love to hear from people, and I would certainly say hi to them, and and uh, I, I I certainly appreciate the opportunity to uh, to talk to you.